Let us go to our Bibles, to the book of Jonah. Chapter 3. Book of Jonah, chapter 3. And verses 5. We're going to read to verses 10. Hopefully most of you know the book of Jonah. It's a book that's widely taught in Sunday school, so everyone should start off their early ages knowing the book of Jonah, the guy who was swallowed by a fish. Um, stayed there for three days and spat out. Um, scholars say actually Jonah died and he was actually a type of Christ. And God raised him from the dead on the third day and spat him out of the fish. Because the poem that Jonah writes while he is in the fish indicates actually that he, he went to the world of the dead. So the people of Nineveh believed God. This is after Jonah has preached to them. And he goes to them to preach a message of repentance because he says, God is going to judge you. He's going to destroy you. The Bible says, the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Let's keep going. I'm going to read until verse 10. Then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man, no beast, herd, no flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. Tell your neighbor your cat is going on a fast. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Then God saw their works. The Bible says God saw their what? Their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God relented from the disaster that he said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. Somebody said he did not do it. Let's read one more verse before I go into my preaching. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 16. Matthew chapter 6. Verses 16. And this is our Savior, our Lord speaking. It says, Moreover, when you fast, look at your neighbor and say, When you fast. Look at your other neighbor and say, said, When, not if. Yeah? When you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Let's keep going. I'm going to read them to verse 18. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in, in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Somebody say amen. amen. I believe that we as a nation... As a people, in the nations of the world, have reached a critical place. I think what saddens me the most about these terrorist attacks that are happening is that whenever you watch the news, Whenever you watch the politicians talking about them, they don't have the solutions. Yeah. What saddens me is that the people who have the solution are asleep. The church. We are the solution yeah. to the issues yeah. that are happening right now. I'm moved by a prophecy by a 
prophet called Prophet Danny Quran who passed away years ago. Don't have time to read it for you. I've read it countless times on the stage, but I'll just remind you paraphrasing. He said that there is a time that is coming when terrorist attacks are going to increase in the world and in Europe. But he said this. He said that the Lord, in paraphrasing, is setting apart the UK. And these terrorist attacks will not be like they are in other places. Because the UK will return to the Lord. He even said that apart from this being a sign, he even said that the vagaries of nature in terms of the weather, how, you know how we just can't predict the weather in this country. He says, as the people return back to God, that nature itself will begin to align itself to its proper seasons. Can I tell you something I just don't have time to go into? You're going to look at me, you're going to laugh, you're probably going to say, but if you sit down with me for a good hour, I can prove my point. Climate change does not exist. Can I tell you what creates climate change? Sin. Read your Bible. It's very clear. Whenever Israel messes up, the weather messes up. Sin is the issue to the world. When we keep talking about climate change, this and that, blah, blah, blah. No, no, it's all a fad. It's an illusion the enemy paints to stop people looking at their sin. Sin is what causes the issues in the world. Somebody say amen. And so the Bible says here that the people of Nineveh declared a fast. And as I was thinking about this, about us separating ourselves, I was saying, God, what is it that you want to do? And God has been speaking to me this for the past three months. I think when Pastor El was away, funny enough, God was speaking to him about the same thing. In fact, when on one of the morning calls, he used the exact same phrase. I said, what? I said, what? That's exactly the phrase God used with me. And this is what the Lord began to speak to me over two months ago. And I was saying to God, what is it you want us in this fast exactly? What is it about? Is it about financial breakthrough for LCF? Some might say yes, that would be nice. Is it about us growing as a church? That would be nice. But really what I felt the Lord said in my heart is, liberty, 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 do you know who you are to this nation? Do you know who you are to this nation? And I feel like God is saying, prophets must arise to speak to the nations, to resolve the issues of the nations. And God is looking for churches who will stand out from the crowd and stand and say, we have a solution to the issues of the nation. Is anybody hearing me? If we do not arise and take our place, this nation will not know God. And the calamities that are buffeting it day and night will continue because we have not taken our place. So we must declare a fast. We must. Because if we do not become who we need to be, then the king of glory cannot come in. If John does not consecrate himself, then the stage is not set for the king of glory to come in. God wants to touch this nation. He wants to touch this nation. And he's looking for believers who will set themselves apart that he might use them. Somebody say amen. Today I posted on the, the WhatsApp group and I say, yo, um, the youth leadership WhatsApp group, and I say, listen guys, I know you guys are having your service today, but could you please cancel your service so we could all be downstairs, please? And I said, the Lord wants us to fast. This is for every single person in this room hearing me. We are consecrating ourselves. And in three days, the Lord shall come 
I'm not saying it literally. I'm using a phrase from Scripture. What Pastor Lincoln felt specifically in his heart was a 21-day fast to kickstart this fasted life. To kickstart this fasted life. And so, I just want to lay the ground scripturally for what fasting is. Possibly finish in a good time just to get one or two questions. And I want us to kickstart our fast in the right way, by prayer. Somebody say amen. I want to look at first what fasting achieved in scripture. I'm going to do this very quickly. Let's just read very quickly Deuteronomy chapter 9 and verses 18. Deuteronomy chapter 9 verse 18. And I fell down before the Lord, this is Moses speaking, at the first of 40 days and 40 nights, neither ate bread nor drink nor drank water because of all your sin which you committed in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Let's just read verse 19. Let me see what's there. For I was afraid of the anger and, and, and the hot displeasure with which the Lord was angry with you to destroy you. But the Lord listened to me at that time also. So this is Moses speaking. This is the birth of Israel. The birth of Israel was birthed through a fast. A 40-day fast. Hmm? There are three people in the Bible who fasted 40 days. Can you name them who they are? Bible scholars. Ready, go. Jesus. Moses, guess who the other one is? Not very well known. Could, no, 21. Guess. Who, 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 usually, who, who usually rolls in that crowd? Moses, Jesus, and Elijah. Three people in scripture who fasted 40 day fast. Moses to establish the Old Testament. Elijah to establish the era of the prophets. And Jesus to establish the New Testament. Each dispensation of God has always been started with a 40-day fast. Hmm? So fasting starts things. Do you have some stuff in your life you want to start? If you want to do it in a way that it will last, get on a fast. Hmm? We just read from Jonah chapter 3 and verses 5. That fasting redeems things. A whole nation was redeemed because, listen, of a collective fast. This is why Pastor Lincoln has decreed this to the church at wide. Because it must be a collective pursuit. We are asking for you to come in agreement with us. And we are going to do this as one. Somebody say amen. amen. Tap your neighbor and say, you are fasting. If you're a visitor, just join in. <laughs> in fact, it's one of the greatest ways to express a collectiveness before God. Is when we all say, we shall fast. So fasting redeems things. Learn that from Jonah. The Bible says that before Nehemiah began to build the walls, he fasted in Nehemiah chapter 1 and verses 4. Fasting builds things. How many of you want to build something? How many of you are trying to put up a structure? Well, the answer to scripture is fast concerning it. In the book of Acts, we're told about a man named Cornelius. Book of Acts chapter 10. The Bible says that he was in fasting when an angel appeared to him and spoke to him about how he could receive salvation for him and his household. Fasting reveals things. Is anybody hearing me? So fasting starts things, fasting redeems things, fasting builds things, fasting reveals things. 
One of the biggest reasons why we as Christians have no clue what's happening is because we do not live fasted lives. I want to talk about why does fasting work? Because that's the way I think. I just, I just, sometimes I read scripture and I'm just like, okay, thank you. I get it. We need to fast. But why? Why? What's going on? But before I do that, I want to tell you what fasting is not. And this shall be clarified as I begin to talk about how it works and why it works. Fasting is not trying to change God's mind. I will quantify that and make it clear. Because one might say, but didn't, after they fasted, didn't, didn't God change his mind? Yes, but principally, that's not what's at play. And you'll know what I mean when I explain. Fasting is not trying to cajole God and say, please do this. If I fast, will you do this? That's not what fasting is. Fasting is not paying with pain and sacrifice that something may happen. It is not that. And the reason I'm saying that is because many religious people have that viewpoint of fasting. I must go through anguish that the Lord might do it. No, Jesus paid it all. He paid it all. And I'll tell you what pleases God. It's faith. That's all you need to please God. Faith. So fasting doesn't somehow make God feel like now you are worthy. Because you've missed out on a couple of McDonald's meals. Yeah? Fasting does not, fasting does not cajole God. It does, it's not paying for God to do something. So I don't want us to go on this journey of fasting feeling like we must subject ourselves in pain so that the Lord will do it. No, he's our father. It's like my son comes to me, Dad, I really want this. And he says, well, you have to go through pain to get it. And many people perceive fasting like that. That's a religious spirit, and I rebuke it in Jesus' name. That's not what fasting is. So, what is fasting? I love this. Psalms 35 and verse 13. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting, and my prayer would return to my own heart. So this person who was, I believe, David, said, I humbled myself with what? Fast. And that's why in the Old Testament, fasting went hand in hand with sackcloth. Sackcloth was, I believe, something that was used very much in agriculture to put, you know, produce in and all this kind of thing. It was a very rough material. Are you with me? And so when you would put on sackcloth, it would literally be itchy. You know that itchy material? And it's like, you're itchy, you're discomforted. When you're wearing sackcloth, you can't sleep for a long time. You can't sit down. You're always reminded of the sense of discomfort. Are you with me? And it was a sign of humility. I believe the sackcloth was like a humility cloak. Whether you were a king in Nineveh or whether you were a pauper, everyone wore sackcloth. There was no nobility when the sackcloth was put on. We were all equal before the eyes of the Lord, great and small. It is a sign of humility. And why is this important? It is important because as we learned last week, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. When you fast, you put yourself in a humbled state before God, and you say, God, only you can do this. My strength, my ability, my energy, my sustenance cannot make this happen. Only you. And when God looks at that humility, he sends grace in response. Is anybody hearing me? How many of you feel like you want to humble yourself before the Lord? Fasting. I love this. Is this, well, before I even tell you, let's go to Matthew chapter 4. 
and verse 4. Some of you have never fasted, and starting tomorrow, it's going to be the first time you've ever fasted. Some of you haven't fasted in a long time. And this is going to be an opportunity for you to fast. But he answered and said, Jesus speaking, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I'm reminded of when the disciples come to Jesus as he's sitting at the well, and he's been, food without, he's been without food for ages, and they, try, they attempt to give him food, and he refuses it. He says, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me. Fasting is a sign of desperation. Have any of you ever gone through something where you could not eat? Hmm? Have, have you ever experienced, I experienced that once in my life, anguish where I could not eat. Where you lose your appetite. And food loses its flavor. And you cannot eat. Because there is something happening that is too colossal for you to consider your stomach. Hmm? If when you are fasting, you do not have something at the core of you, pushing you because of a sense of urgency, then you need to find that thing for it to be a fasting that will be adequate. You must find passion, the passion of desperation when fasting. To say, God, I need to hear you more than I need to eat. Hmm? That's what it's about. Can I tell you something which is very simple, but very also very so shocking? What caused the fall of man was food. <laughs> it wasn't a fancy car. It was, it was what? It was food. It was food. It's the stomach. Sensual appetites. The need to feed the flesh. And when you put aside food, something happens in the spiritual realm. Something happens to your spirit. Something happens to you. Is anybody hearing me? It's a sign of desperation. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 12 that we should put to death the dictates of the flesh by the power of the spirit. Fasting is disciplining the flesh. Number four, fasting is a sign of faith. It's a sign of faith. Let's read Matthew chapter 17, verse 19 to 21. A very interesting scripture here. And I'll explain why it's a sign of faith. Matthew chapter 17, verse 19 to 21. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief. For surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. Verse 21. However, somebody say small print. <laughs> small print. Little foxes. This kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. So, fasting is not faith, but it is a sign of your faith. 
Because from the time you get to the point of putting away food and disciplining this flesh and going through hunger pangs, you better believe something. Are you with me? You don't just subject yourself to such for no reason. And so if you believe God, then fasting becomes a sign of your faith because faith without works is dead. So do we believe God can touch this nation? Hmm? Do we believe, and this is the word, the key word God gave me over two months ago. Do we believe God can bring an awakening to the nation of Britain? That was the word, an awakening. Do you know what? It's sad. It's, this also saddens me. That when this stuff happens, do you realize the nation does not turn to God? There's only one. I'll, I'll give this to America. When that stuff happens, the churches are full the next Sunday. At least they have somewhere in their backbone, somewhere, a reference to the fact that maybe we should go to church. Maybe the answer is, is that man who sits up there. But for our nation, you can tell how backslidden Britain is. Because when this stuff happens, there is no return to God. People cry, they hold vigils, but God is nowhere to be mentioned. The only solution to the issues of this nation is nowhere. Because this nation needs an awakening. Do you know that everybody in this room is a missionary to this nation? Look at neighbor and say, do you know you're a missionary? You would be shocked how many people do not know the message of the gospel in this nation. You would actually be shocked. When you ask people, I remember I was, I was listening to one of our um, um, youth leaders one time sitting down with a group of people, a group of young people, and asked them, and these were young people who came from Christian homes. So he asked them, what's your perception of Jesus? The person nearly hit the floor when they heard who the young people thought Jesus was. They had all of these theories, but none of them accurate. Fasting is a sign of our faith. But God, you have called us. God, you can do this. And so how does fasting work? And I'll finish with this and we'll grab a couple of questions. Listen to me. Man is pseudo-psychosomatic. His spirit, soul, and body. Fasting is actually a principle a lot of spiritual people use. It's not only common to Christianity. So before you get excited and say, ah, we fast as Christians. No, no, no. The Hindus fast. Witches fast. Muslims fast. So fasting is a principle because it does something. What is going on when someone fasts? Hmm? Number one, fasting weakens the body. See, because man is not the body. Man is a spirit. That's really who you are. And your spirit man is the one that speaks to God. God doesn't speak to your body. He speaks to your spirit. Are you with me? The issue is too many of us have a strong body, strong flesh. The voice of the flesh in many of our lives is too loud. Are you with me? So fasting weakens the body. And you feel it. The first day when you start fasting, OMG, you feel it. You feel your body just going, what are you doing to me? <laughs> Second day, what is this? You get headaches, you get, and it's saying, I need food, give me food. And the third day, by the fourth day, you start to feel it. You're, you're weak in your flesh. And you feel the sense of calm. Even for us who love to run around sinning, or not for us, it's not, you know what I mean, but... You know, for people who are in a sinful life, when you are in a state of physical weakness, you start to lose the appetite for sin. Yeah. I don't have energy to expend on such things. Right. It weakens the body. 
fasting disciplines the soul. Because to say no to food, when your body is saying, give it to me, your soul has to be strong. So there's a disciplining of the soul. So your body is being weakened, yet your mind is being strengthened through its will to say, I will not eat because I've set my heart and mind on something else. Disciplines the soul. But Christian fasting, most fasting stops there. Christian fasting empowers the spirit. And that's why it's always fasting and prayer. They're always attached. If you fast without prayer, it's a diet. You're trying to lose weight. It's not Christian fasting and prayer. Please understand this. If you go on these 21 days and you have no prayer attached to your fasting, you're dieting. Right? Now, that has its benefits physically, but it won't give you the spiritual benefits if you do not pray. Are you with me? So that's what fasting does. Now, this brings us to a very interesting statement that Jesus said. That Jesus said to his disciples in that verse we just read. He said, some do not go but through fasting and prayer. So I've got a question for Jesus. So Jesus, what did you do? Did you know this demon was going to come? So you fasted because you knew the demon was there? Jesus, what's going on? How come Jesus at every moment you could cast out all demons? Because Jesus was in a perpetual state of fasting. He was always in a state where his flesh was weak, his soul was disciplined, and his spirit was empowered. And Jesus said, these kind only go for the Christians who have weakened the flesh, disciplined the soul, and their spirit is empowered. These kind won't stand against such. The problem with us as Christians is we have too many Christians who are strong in the flesh and disciplined in the soul and their spirit is sleeping. So you say, I rebuke you. The demon looks at you and says, did you hear that? I think I heard a whimper somewhere. Now you see, fasting does not change God, it changes you. That's all fasting is doing. It's making and turning your frequency so you can hear him better. That's why at the end of most fasts you see angels appearing. It's not that these angels wouldn't have appeared. Do you know how many angels are showing up at your house but you can't see them? You can't sense them. Do you know how much God is actually speaking to you? How much God is actually giving you an idea to get out of the solution you're, and the issues you're actually in? You just can't hear him. So fasting tunes your spirit. Say, hey, God, you're speaking. He's like, no, no, I was always speaking. I was always speaking. Remember Elijah when he finally gets to that place? Um, Mount, what's it? Um, is it? Mount Carmel and, and he wants to hear God and that's the period of time I believe he was on that fast during that time while he was trying to get there and he finally gets there and um, uh, when he gets there he, he, he listens out and he's trying to hear God and he says it in the still small voice and what does God say to him when he finally gets when he hears God he says what are you doing here in other words I've been trying to speak to you and he finally gets through to him he says what are you doing here God is always speaking he's always speaking but our spirits are always at such a weak state to hear. So God is speaking concerning. Can you hear God well enough to know not to get on a train that's going to have a terror attack? I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to say, this is how God wants to speak to us. I remember John Paul Jackson said that um, he had a vision and he saw a certain NASA spaceship that was going to explode on its, um, what do you call it? Takeoff. So he called NASA, John Paul Jackson called NASA and said, do not let that spaceship take off. It is going to explode. Of course they said, who is this weird dude? Yeah. Needless to say, guess what happened? <laughs> Exploded. There are testimonies of people on 9-11. On, on people said, I woke up and something said, do not go to work. Do not go to work. Because their spirits were acute enough to hear. Hmm? Is your spirit empowered enough to hear?
If it is not, fasting will do it. Amen? I think I'll stop there. I just want to give an opportunity for maybe one or two questions that somebody might want to ask. And then we can orientate ourselves and, and just do some prayer as we end the service. Any quick questions that somebody might want to ask in regards to fasting? Our prayer. Yes. It just shout it out nice and loud, love line. Are all fasts equal? Well, I will say this. Number one, fasting is not fasting unless you fast from food. Yeah? So I've, I know that there is there's a notion of fasting from media, fasting from this. All things brilliant. In fact, in our day and age, a fast cannot be complete unless you're fasting from media. Because media is so much junk, it undisciplines the soul too much. So on our fast, most people need to switch off media and use that time to focus on the Lord. Um, so I will say, as long as your fasting includes some aspect of, of not consuming food, yeah, then you have, um, then, you, then it should be fine. I always tell people to listen to God for themselves in regards to how they should fast. But what I would always recommend is if you are new to fasting, there's different ways you can try fasts. You can start by simply skipping a meal. You can do that. Um, you can try by skipping a couple of meals and eating later on in the evening. You know, you can do that. Or you can try, as Daniel did, the 21-day fast we're famous for, where Daniel only ate um, vegetables and stayed away from meat and dairy products. Are you with me? So that, that's what you call a vegan, correct? So basically, it's going vegan for 21 days. So you're staying away from meat. You're staying away from processed food. Processed foods are... You know, anything that is overly processed that has lost its natural sense of food, you know, um, I don't know, biscuits, cakes, all of that, processed food, processed sugars, so sugar, getting sugar out of your diet, going vegan for 21 days. Why is everyone laughing? Because I <laughs> Yeah, so 21 days, and since the 21-day fast... I'm challenging most people. If you want, you can. I'm going to do um, a Daniel fast for these 21 days. I'm going to do a Daniel fast with, in, with also um, some, some food fasts as the Lord leads me, as in abstaining from food for certain times during the day as the Lord leads me. Now, when your, your fasting is selective eating in the sense, you say no cakes, no biscuits. What is another processed food? Chocolate. Chocolate. Oh, my God. Chocolate. Ugh, chocolate. Um, <laughs> it's, this is serious. It becomes serious. Now, you do not now say, okay, now I'm going to eat vegetables until even, you know. Don't heap up on the others because you've lost out on some. There's got to be a sense of separation from food. This, the whole, the power of the stomach to demand and the body to demand for something to taste is, is spiritual. I tell you this. Yeah. It is spiritual. The power, the desire to have something in your mouth is, is spiritual. You, we can't go deep enough, but in scripture, your food is part of your spiritual heritage. Yeah. In fact, if God would choose where to stay, you will live in the kitchen <laughs> in your house. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, I will come in and do what? And watch telly with them. He says, I'll sup with you. I'll sit at the dinner table. There's something about food and its appeal. So if you've not fasted before, you will notice that when you say I'm fasting, everything will become lovely. My God, you pass a bakery and you feel, Oh my God, bread. Oh, bananas. Uh, the whole world wakes up. Food becomes such a part. When you now turn away from that, something amazing happens to your spirit. Yeah. Yeah. So that turning away through the day, turning away, turning away, turning away from snack, 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 turn away from the snack. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. I want to eat that. Turn away from that. It, and you turn away and immediately in the power of that, you ask for God's help. Yeah. You ask for God's touch. So you pray through the day. So please don't say I'll fast while I'm sleeping. 
So I'll, I'll fast in the night and I'll eat in the morning. You're missing the power of fasting. <laughs> in fact, <laughs> why it's called breakfast is really you break the fast in the morning. I shouldn't be talking long. Truth is, guys, we, we're putting away some... Now, depending on your own experience, because we have a 21-day season, and we are even talking about a fasted life, you don't have to... Please avoid extreme fastings, which can become dangerous. Especially if you're not used to fasting, and you're saying, I'm not eating for seven days. That's not good for you. Not even three days. Make sure you hydrate. 